Let's go ahead and take our seats. We have some we have some new sound people back there today. There he is. All right. Um, so the Mr. Mr. Mowry just left. He's going to Illinois to take care of some issues with his dad. Um, the Wilsons are gone because they're doing Colorado stuff. You what? You can't hear me? Well, there we go. There's a fine line between you can hear me and we don't want to ever hit that line. So um, we're really close to that line right now because every once in a while I get a little bit loud. So, um, so we have some missing people here. The Smiths aren't here. Uh, the Ryans. Man. You know, we spent money on air conditioning. There's no reason why they couldn't be here. What? 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 <sighs> All right. So, anyway, let's pray, and we will begin. Lord, we just want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for those that are here, and we just want to pray for those that aren't here. We, we know that some are traveling, and some aren't here for other reasons, but we just want to lift them up to you. We pray that as we go through our worship time here, Lord, that we could focus that time solely on you and just put aside all the distractions of the world and offer up the one thing that we can, Lord, and that's just praise. Praise of you and praise of your mercy and your grace and all the things that you've done for us. And we just lift this time up to you now, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. group today, but we are a mighty group, right? We are a mighty group. Right? You guys ready? Yeah. yeah. Let's worship the king. Oh, I don't have any of my music at all. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Do I have to have it in order? No, you can play whatever you want with it. <laughs> yeah, everyone will sing that, and... the way 
are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my Clappers ready. Y'all gonna clap with me? Sand. Stomp your feet and clap your hands. Our feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Stomp your feet and clap your hands. Our feet are on the rock. Sing it. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. 
stomp your feet and clap your hands. Our feet are on the rock. When I feel my There are three books in the Bible known as the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. The first, Proverbs, showed us that God is wise and just. Yeah, we learned that God has ordered the world so that it's fair. The righteous are rewarded, the wicked are punished. In other words, you get what you deserve. But then we meet Ecclesiastes who observes, well, people don't always get what they deserve. Uh, yeah, he said the world isn't always fair, that life is unpredictable and hard to comprehend, just like smoke. And this makes you wonder, okay, well, is God wise and just? Exactly. And so it's that question that is being explored in the final book of wisdom, Job. All right, let's dive in. So Job begins with a strange story that takes place up in the heavens, which are described something like a heavenly command center. So God is there with these angelic creatures called the sons of God, and they're all there reporting for duty. And God points out this guy Job, his servant, showing how righteous and good he is. And then one of these angelic creatures approaches. He's referred to in Hebrew as the Satan. The Satan. Who is this? Well, this word is actually a title, which literally means the one who is opposed. So out of this whole crew, he is the one questioning how God is running the world. And he proposes that Job might not actually love God, that he's only a good person because God rewards him. If God were to take away all of the good things he gave to Job, then we would see his true colors. So he thinks Job is just working the system? That's exactly right. Maybe he's obeying just to get what he wants. So God agrees to this experiment and allows the Satan to inflict suffering on Job. And Job loses everyone and everything that he cares about. It is devastating. And remember, he deserves none of this. God himself said so. The remarkable thing is that in the midst of all this suffering, Job still praises God. At least for chapters one and two. But then in chapter three, we find out how he's really feeling inside. He unleashes this poem that reveals his devastation. It's a long, elaborate curse on the day that he was born. After this, some of Job's friends come to visit him to offer their help. And all of them are like, Job, you must have done something horribly wrong to deserve this. After all, we know God is just, and we know the world is ordered by God's justice and fairness, so you must be getting what you deserve. And for the next 34 chapters, the friends and Job go back and forth in very dense Hebrew poetry. His friends keep speculating about why God might have sent such suffering, and they even start making up lists of hypothetical sins that Job must have committed. But after each accusation, Job defends his innocence. And Job is innocent. He is. He's also on an emotional roller coaster. At some moments, he's very confident that God is still wise and just. Yeah, in other moments, he's doubting God's goodness. He even comes to accuse God of being reckless, unfair, and corrupt. So by the end of the dialogue, Job demands that God come and explain himself in person. And God does so. He comes in the form of a great storm cloud. Now, God doesn't give Job a direct answer. He doesn't tell Job about the conversation with the Satan. Yeah, he does something very different. He takes Job on a virtual tour of the universe. He shows Job how grand the world is, and he asks him if he's even capable of running it or understanding it just for a day. 
He shows Job how much detail there is in the world, things that we might see every day but really don't understand at all. But God does. He knows it all intimately. He pays attention to the beauty and operations of the universe in ways that we haven't even imagined and in places that we will never see. Then to conclude, God shows Job two wondrous beasts and brags about how great they are. Yeah, they are dangerous. I mean, they would kill you without even thinking about it. And God says they're not evil. They're actually a part of his good world. And then that's it. That's God's whole defense. It's kind of weird. I mean, what was this all about? It seems to be this. From Job's point of view, it looks like God is not just. But God's perspective is infinitely bigger. He's dynamically interacting with a whole universe of complexity when he makes decisions. And this is what God calls his wisdom. So Job asking God to defend himself is actually kind of absurd. He couldn't comprehend this kind of complexity even if he wanted to. So where does this leave us? Well, it leaves Job in a place of humility. He never learned why he suffered, and yet he's able to live in peace and in the fear of the Lord. But that's not where the book ends, because after this, God restores to Job double everything he had lost. And this, again, is surprising. I mean, is this a reward? Is God saying, congratulations, Job, you passed this elaborate test? No. I mean, the whole book just made the point that Job losing everything was not a punishment. And so now getting it back isn't a reward. So why does he get it back? Well, apparently God, in his wisdom, decided to give Job a gift. We don't know why. But what we do know is that Job is now the kind of person who, no matter what comes, good or bad, he can trust God's wisdom. And that's the book of Job and the end of our wisdom series. These biblical books of wisdom are amazing. Each one offers a unique perspective on the good life, and you need to hear all of them together as you learn to live with wisdom and in the fear of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, it's announcement time, and then we're going to do uh, praise and prayer requests. So um, first announcement is don't forget that we have a uh, box in the foyer for putting your tithes and offerings. Um, you can also do it on the website. Um, <clears throat> so there are those two avenues of uh, giving to the Lord. Um, a second thing is I've been talking talking for the last two weeks, and this is week three, about rules and res uh, roles and responsibilities. Uh, I still haven't had any volunteers, so I'm going to start voluntolding people. Um, <clears throat> so I will let everybody know what they will be doing next Sunday. Um, and then also next Sunday is the block party. Okay. And don't forget, next Saturday is my birthday party. It's an open house from 2 till 6 p.m. Um, there will be finger foods. Um, gifts are not required. Uh, there will be shooting at some stage in the afternoon as well, so bring your uh, freedom sticks. <coughs> your Second Amendment items. All right. Um, yes. Yes. It's normal. <laughs> if we change it till six to eight, you're thinking? Right. Okay, so lock party time is changing to six till eight p.m. Okay, just so we can avoid the heat. Yeah. All right. Yes, Troy. Uh, my thing. So, 
We were at the movie theater last night and we were talking with Gary. The movie theater's been closed because we're all gonna die because of COVID. Um, what he had told us, which is kind of neat, is we can rent the movie theater for a church function yeah. and he can play a movie as part of our, oh no, it's not a movie, it's a introductory video on instructing how to, church instructional, church instructional video that we can watch and take life lessons from said instructional video. Anyway, we can do that and it's actually very inexpensive. So if we as a church body would like to do a group organizational growth time, that would be cool. So let me know and we'll set up a night and just go do All it. Right. So a group organizational growth person. night. Growth, growth night. There you go. Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Kay, are the blessing bags still a thing? Are we still carrying on with that? Blessing bags. Not allowed to hand them out. <coughs> okay. If people have like money, if <laughs> I like a salad bar. Okay. If people have money or items that they want to give to you, they can still do that, though. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So it's temporarily paused. Hopefully it will resume again later. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes? I'd like to go and I'd like to be active. Okay. All right. We'll wait for your direction on that. All right. I think that's all the notices. I can't think of any more. Okay. Um, praise and prayer. Does anyone have any praise? Yes, Zachary. We did. I had a very, very helpful eldest son, and <coughs> we got the gravel pad for my outdoor office complete. Yes, Danielle. Um, can I say that first Sorry? Can you do that to the first time? Oh, okay. Yes, okay. So, Mrs. Neyman can feel better. Yes, definitely. Um, anything else? Yes, Teresa. Okay, so Greg got off fine. Um, by the looks of things, the Wilsons also got off fine. Sorry? Okay, so, so that's good. Yes, Josiah. You hope they have a safe trip. Excellent, yes. We will pray for the Wilsons and their trip up to Colorado this week, that they have a safe trip and that they have a great time with their family. We'll also be praying for Greg as he's, he's driving up, hey? Yes. As he's driving up to Illinois. Yes, Kay. We have classes coming up tomorrow to evaluate the rental place. Yes. Okay. So Wendy will be with me to highlight her son so she can ask questions that I don't know. Okay. So ho here. hospice is coming tomorrow for <coughs> the elder Mr. Cameron? Yeah. All right. So, yes, Wendy. I'm still on Facebook. Yes. Yes. We have the whole Cameron family here. That's really awesome. <coughs> Lots of Camerons. Great to have them all here. Yes. 
Um, yes, Sarah. Yes. For Jenna's grandfather, yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right, yeah. So, praise that he's doing better, prayer that he continues to be do better, and prayer for the eye surgery. Okay. Yes, Wendy. Sarah, is your uncle being transferred to New Mexico this week? I'm just asking her. She is watching, so I'll. I've got. <coughs> yeah, we will. Um, we will. Yeah. Also, we'll pray. Continue praying for Uncle Dan. Um, I think we need to also pray for Josh. Josh specifically, and Kristen. Uh, Josh was at a fire yesterday afternoon in 104 degree heat. He had smoke inhalation. <coughs> And he's feeling really sick, so we'll pray for, pray for Josh as well. Um, and I'm just waiting to see if we get any feedback from the Wilsons. Anything else? Yes, Teresa. Yes. So pray for uh, the remaining contingent of uh, Maoris for mending the fence this afternoon. Um, the least amount of nicks, I think, both on a uh, interpersonal level and on a physical level. <laughs> yes, Sarah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. One way or another, um, whether it's every, every single step, every single step. Okay. So praying for the schools, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of controversy that's probably going to happen due to decisions they have to make. Um, so if we can just continue praying for the peop all the people involved in the school this year, um, the students, the teachers, Everyone. Oh, um, yes, Troy. going to pray for Awana, um, just so that, pray for the children, pray for the people that are hosting it, pray for a good year. We're going to start soon-ish, starting in August, right? Yeah, first, week in September. first week in September. Okay, first week in September is when. I do have another prayer, but I also want to pray for, to pray for Kai. Mm -hmm. Yes, Kai yes. His health is yes. Excellent. Is Kai's health is improving. Yeah. All right, I haven't received any word from Sarah Wilson yet on Uncle Dams, so, but, yeah. Yeah, so. All right, well, we'll, we'll pray for all the uncles and for everything that's there. <laughs> okay, anything else? Jeremy? Okay. 
Yes. <laughs> Jeremy is working at Popeyes. So. <laughs> so it's, it's it's a good thing, it's a good thing to have a job. So well done, Jeremy. And it's definitely a praise. All right. Okay. Troy, would you start us off, please? And then anybody can pray. You can bring any prayers. Um, and then I will close us off at the end. Lord, we just want to thank you for your grace and your mercy. And we come before you now with a petition that we know that you have the power to do anything, Lord. So we just ask that you would um, please give travel mercies to Greg, um, to Troy Wilson, to Terry Groin, and for Daniel and Ken as they go back. Lord God, we want to pray for the Wilsons and for Greg as they are um, traveling. 
we pray for travel mercies for them pray that they would have uh, good trips um, no issues along the way um, Lord we pray for Greg and the issues he has to sort out up in Illinois with his dad I pray Lord that you would you would have your hand continue to have your hand on that situation you would uh, make sure that the right thing happens make sure that justice happens um, and we thank you Lord for the blessings that you have laid on Greg and on his family so far Lord we want to pray that the Wilsons have a great time with their family up in Colorado. We thank you that uh, that we can all have times with family. We thank you, Lord, for the Camerons, the extended Cameron family that is visiting today. Um, we thank you for um, for that family time. Uh, Lord God, we just we also want to just continue praying for um, Uncle Dan and the situation over there um, we pray that you would continue to help him to heal um, help the family to deal with with the with everything around that i know that they were moving him back to new mexico and i pray that that would be smooth um, i pray that the family would would come together and rather than fighting that they would have unity um, that and lord that through all of this that y that your glory would be shown to them um, I thank you Lord again for the freedom that we have in this country to uh, to worship you and I pray Lord for those around the world our brothers and sisters that don't have that freedom um, that are being persecuted I pray for strength for them um, and I pray for your, your blessing on your church around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I had to put that back for my wife so she doesn't, because she's short. I didn't want to say it like that. How y'all doing? You guys doing good? Yeah. Everybody wake up. Wake up. Ah! Those are my glasses. Um, so, last week, we started to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's basically two different sections. Um, we dealt with head coverings last week, the titillating subject of head coverings. This week we're going to look at the Lord's Supper. Um, if you remember from last week, it was really more a, there was it was really more than just about head coverings. The women were riling up the men by trying to usurp the men's authority in the house and. We compared that to what we see today in the gender neutrality movement, and we can see it, it's just not natural, or what God has for his church body. God is a, he's a God of order, not chaos. And we also learned that this was leading to real contentiousness within the body of, of Corinth. Um, of course it was. There were people doing what ought not to be done, and there was, there was those who really cared about what was happening in the church that were really getting upset about it. Uh, Paul's going to kind of continue with this theme as we finish chapter 11. He's not going on with head coverings, but with the Lord's Supper. People were again doing this in a way that they shouldn't be doing, and again there was contention. We, we see this today. There are some who come here to worship, and there's a lot of people that come here for other reasons. We're going to look at three parts today. Um, we're going to look at division, communion, and judgment. And why was there division? What was the point of the Lord's Supper and communion? And how do we properly judge ourselves so that we are ready to receive what God has for us. 
So please stand as we um, read God's word. We're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. We're going to be going th- from 17 through the end of the chapter here. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not for the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you, have, do you not have houses to eat or drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the blood, the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body and drinks judgment on himself, that is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if, you, if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Amen. You may be seated. Division. Why do we have division in our churches today? There's a couple of really good reasons we see division. Um, none, None of them are good, but it's important that we know what they are so that we can recognize them. First, let's be honest with ourselves. There are some that truly don't want to be here. Um... And and there's ones that truly do. You're going to have division between those two people. We also see that maybe you have somebody who they're here because their spouse drug them here. They didn't really want to come, but their husband or wife just nagged them into coming. No, I'm not looking at anybody in particular. (laughs) Um... Maybe, kids, maybe you don't really want to be here, but your parents drug you here, right? I I know that there's some out there, and I know that that happens. Whatever the reason that they're here, there's 150 other places that they would rather be right now. So I'm sure you could see why there would be a division between those two groups of people. Secondly, you see a division between people who are ultra legalistic and you see people who are totally liberal and one group wants everyone in a suit and tie and the other you know in long dresses for the women and the other ones are like shorts and t-shirts and flip-flops and who really cares right um one group values being super comfortable sometimes too comfortable and uh, others focus on reverence and you could see why you'd have division between those people. Thirdly, you have people that preach hellfire and damnation. We're all going to die. And we have those that preach grace. You have your Calvinists, you have your Arminians, you have your long day people, you have your short day creation people. There are so many different things that divide us as a body. 
And, and that's one of the reasons that I'm so particular and serious when it comes to properly dividing the Word of God. There's a lot of division out there that's from just flat out bad teaching. Just look at what we've learned so far just in the book of 1 Corinthians. You, you had people coming in and teaching that the Corinthians, after becoming Christians, that they still had to follow the laws of Moses. You had people that were coming in and teaching different types of idol worship. You had people who were teaching that um, there was these different pagan gods that they should follow. Should we follow Paul or Apollos? All of this stuff was going on, and Paul's coming in now to correct that. You remember, these people did not have Bibles, okay? We, we do. There's really no excuse for bad teaching in today's society because we have God's Word written out. We just have to remember that there's a proper way to interpret Scripture, and there's a wrong way to interpret it. How, how many of you guys have heard, well... That's how you interpret scripture. You guys ever heard that? And then they'll say, you know, there's many ways. There's many different ways that we can interpret scripture. And, and literally that line makes me want to just scream. Oh, do you see Mr. Miyagi up there? Um, th that line makes me want to scream. Because the reality is, no, there's not many different ways to teach to interpret scripture there's a right way and there's a wrong way and sadly we see a lot of people who interpret wrongly teaching people who don't research and you've got a mess because you have you have people that just flat out don't understand biblical truths I, when we were going through the book of Acts I showed you guys chart after chart after chart of just basic biblical concepts that people who go to church every single week do not understand. They don't know. I think it was, I don't remember, it was like 65% of every week churchgoers didn't know what the Great Commission was. That's just bad teaching. That's all that is. Um, so the point is you can see why there's so many divisions that are happening you throw all the denominational stuff on top of that and you can see why the body of christ is an absolute mess and you can see why paul even in the early church in the in the in the corinthian church um you can see why even they had the same issues that we do today Our, ours is on a way bigger scale um because there's so many more people and there's so much more division. There's so many different denominations and so much stuff going on now. But Paul was chastising them because when they were coming together as a body, there was still division there. And I, I just asked the question, how do you think Paul would come into the church in America today and chastise us? It, it, it would be pretty, it'd be pretty embarrassing, really. I've said this before when we were studying the book of Acts, but the reality is, and this is a sad reality, I don't see the church of Christ, the church as a whole, coming back together on, on these issues. Um, instead of standing firm on the truth of God's word, many are standing firm on a denominational viewpoint or um, basically just whatever religion that they follow. And I'm, I'm unwilling to compromise um, on truth. So there's bodies that are divided. I'm not happy about the division that there is. Did we lose my mic? Yeah. What happened? All right. Do you guys hear me? All right. I would ask Sarah, but it would take her forever to get back to us. Um, so, I'm not willing to compromise on that truth. It, and it stinks that if they can hear me, Jonathan can hear me through the thing, so we're good. Um, 
the reality, it's, it's sad that it's sad that there's division. It's sad that we have to go through that division. But I, I'm never going to just stand up here and tickle your ears so that I can have you all go, yeah, agree with him, because what he's saying is totally compromised and it sounds great to us. That, that's, not, that's not what my job is. My job's to rightly divide the word of truth and to give it to you guys. And I, I won't ever compromise that. If you have time, turn, turn over real quick to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Actually, you don't have to. It's up there. Um, somebody jumped the gun. Gun jumper. Um, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Repro- reprove, rebuke, and exhort and with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry." This is the problem in the church today. The vast majority of churches are looking for somebody to teach them what they want to hear, not the truth. I can tell you, I can tell you pastoral search committees that flat out say, we want somebody who's going to teach us what we want to hear. Th- that's not the church, guys. A- and the problem that you run into is that there are those serious about the church and the message and the work of the gospel and those two conflict they fight with those who don't really care that's a big problem that we have in the church today you guys see and I know that every single person in this room and those at home have seen people who have watched their pastor compromise on biblical truths they've seen it happen and they still stay there because well I love my church family well if the guy up front's teaching you garbage I don't care how much you love the people you can't stay there Paul is having a real issue with division in the church for a reason I do too I won't uh, you guys I will never understand Because one of the first things that I talked about was people coming here who don't really want to be here. That makes no sense to me. Literally makes no sense to me. You come to work, or you come to church week in and week out to listen to me blab on about something you don't care about. Why are you here? What's the point? And then... Those people that don't want to be here, they'll argue with people in the church about stuff that they've heard. I'm sure that there's a PlayStation 4 or a Wii you should be playing at home. There's no point in being at a church body that that you don't believe anything that the pastor says and you don't care to. It makes no sense to me. We don't want to come to this place because we have to. We should come here because we want to. This place is supposed to be like family. You know what? Family has disagreements. But families built on a solid foundation work through issues in love. That, that's, that's what the body is supposed to do. And we don't... I I had this conversation with a dear friend of mine the other day who's having problems with her pastor at her church. And she says to me, you know, what do I do? You write a letter or you talk to him. You don't just ignore it and let it just go away. You deal with the issue. Now, if it doesn't get dealt with in the way that it should or how you feel comfortable that biblically it should be dealt with, leave. Leave. Find a church where the, where the pastor deals with things in a biblical way. But, but we don't do that. You know what we just do? We just go there and go, well, you know, I'm okay with that compromise. I'm fine with that. It, and it just keeps building and building and building. 
And if you have any soul, if you have any biblical truth, eventually you just snap because you can't stay there. When somebody's doing something that you know's wrong, you get to, I, I, I told somebody this the other day. I said, you're always going to look at that pastor now and go, is he telling me the truth? Because if he's willing to compromise on this, what else is he willing to compromise on? And you don't really know. And it's something that you have to sit there and go, am I willing to do this? That's what Paul's got issues with. How can you sit there and just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again when you know it's wrong? So Paul gets into his second rebuke here. These people were not being respectful of the Lord's Supper. What we see described here in our text is basically a bunch of potlucks that have gone wrong. Okay? This would have easily, easily been fixed by having Baptists run the whole thing. <laughs> we, we all know that. First, you'd have order, and you'd have no drinking, and it would all be solved, right? I'm kidding, of course, but this was a real issue. The early church had what they called love feasts or charity feasts, okay? And it basically was. It was kind of the same concept as a potluck. They would come together as a church, and they would eat a meal. And the rich would bring what they had out of their abundance. The poor would bring kind of what they had to eat. And it sounds great, right? Well, they, they had a few problems. And Paul goes, Paul says that each one goes ahead with his own meal. So, if you guys remember from when we were teaching in the book of Acts, you kind of had the same issue that was going on there. You had people that were bringing food, and they were, they were, just, they were bringing it, and they weren't distributing the food evenly to the people, Okay? So what happened was they got all the elders involved and the elders would distribute the food. So think, think of it like this. You're, you're a poor guy and you bring some bread to this potluck, okay? Well, let's say, let's say like Josh. Josh comes and he brings all this cooked up awesome carne asada meat. And then he sits down and eats it with his friends and you brought this little bread. Well, when you get there, there's no carne asada meat, there's just bread that you brought. So you're stuck there, like, you know, Troy, I'm a poor guy, so I sit there with my little bread, eating. And the problem was, is you had greed. You had greed that was happening in these potluck issues, or in these potluck meals, these love feasts were not loving at all. And they weren't, they weren't showing brotherly love. Secondly, a huge, huge Baptist no-no. They were getting drunk. They obviously did not have a potluck committee. You needed a couple older ladies with some wooden spoons there keeping everybody in line. And this problem would have been solved real quick. But what was happening was your rich were basically turning the church into a social club where the elites would eat together and they would party like it's 99. See what I did there? The rest would just go off and sit by themselves eating crumbs. And it's a horrible look and a bad representation of Christ. They miss the whole concept of love, feast, and sharing and they weren't, they weren't dealing properly with what the Lord gave them. So the worst part of it was they missed the opportunity to show the love of Christ, okay? So we don't need a potluck committee to show that treating people with respect and honor is important. We know that we shouldn't be getting drunk in the first place, let alone at church. So, Paul's issue here is what kind of a horrible witness is that? Let's say that I invite Daniel and 
Kim. Hi, welcome to Cornerstone. We're going to be having a party over here. There's going to be kegs and all kinds of cool stuff when we're done. And they're like, whoa, whoa, hold it. This is like a church, right? That's what we're dealing with. So the third point, and this is kind of the big one, is that they intertwined communion into this mess of, of a fellowship meal. So this was the Lord's Supper that they were doing this at, right? Fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ is really important. How we conduct ourselves in love towards one another is important. Proper communion practices and reverence to that practice is important. Most churches, every church I've been at, does separate communion from their potluck feast a lot because of this. Things are said during potlucks that probably shouldn't be, and it should never be intertwined with the Lord's Supper. Potluck is a time, and there's, there's two very different reasons for it, and I'm going to show you why here. Potluck time is where we come together as a body, okay? We break bread, we share a meal. We talk, we laugh, we share with other things that are going on in our lives, right? The idea is to draw the body close together as, as we grow together in Christ. It's, it's a horizontal relationship. It's us and everyone around us. It's very important, but it's not the same as communion. Communion is a vertical relationship. It is between us and God only. Communion, prayer, and worship are the three vertical things that we do, and they're all important when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ. So Paul lays out here for them the proper way of doing communion. And he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he, betrayed, when he was betrayed, he took bread. So he lays out, here's the proper way to do communion. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, do this, or this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. It's about us remembering what he did for us. It's truly a personal thing because our salvation is personal. I can, have, I, can have a, I can have a fellowship meal with all of you people all day long. I, I don't know what your salvation position is in life. I have no idea. We can talk about all kinds of sports, football. We can talk about all kinds of, none of it's happening. We can talk about those things. But our, it's not a vertical relationship with Christ. We do these we do communion because we remember what he did for us. Paul's warning is for them to remember Christ in a way that is worthy. So our last point is judgment. Paul says when we do communion in an unworthy manner that we bring judgment on ourselves. If any of you happen to read this, in the King James Version, you're going to see a pretty major translation error. The King James Version says that you drinketh damnation to yourself. Paul talks about temporary things like illness and, and weakness. Um, he did say that some died, but the King James Version puts you straight in hell. It's, it's just a bad translation. I think here the context of what Paul's trying to get around is that it's an obvious point of correction and rebuke. You're not doing this right. You need to correct it. You need to judge yourselves. You need to make sure that what we're doing here is done in a way that is important. We're doing this in remembrance of his grace and his mercy that he poured out on us. He didn't have to, but he did it because he loves us. To damn us to hell because we did it wrong 
that, that's just no. That's not the point. That would d- completely defeat the purpose. It's one of the reasons I, get, I, I have issues with King James only people is because stuff like this. It, it's not the point of the text at all. It's not even in the context of what it is. Paul's warning is to judge ourselves truly. Communion is a time to reflect and repent if needed. A time to evaluate ourselves and see if we're truly living in a way that Christ would have us. We're communing with God. If your heart isn't right, don't partake. It would be taking it in an unworthy manner. You can grab a cup and a piece of bread like nothing's wrong. You can fool me and you can fool everybody in here. But you're not fooling God. He knows where you're at. If you're struggling with stuff, just stop it. Christ is always faithful to forgive you. I don't care how bad it is. Don't, don't fake it. We have to come clean to the table. Or we eat and drink judgment on ourselves. Paul says here that if, if we do that, if we're honest with ourselves and do what is right, God's not going to judge us. If you're truthful with yourself and you go, you know, I really have this going on and I really need to fix this because it's not what God would have for me. You know what's happening. You're correcting it on your own. God doesn't need to come down on you like that. And I'm going to tell you right now, you correcting it's always better than him correcting it for you. Always. He's not going to let his children misbehave and be condemned along with the world. He didn't save you for that. But today we see the church doing the same kind of selfish, greedy stuff that the world did. And God's not going to have that. I, I love this reminder to seriously look at ourselves because it's really not just about the communion table. It's life. I, I've seen people, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I've seen people, I've been, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been at the church thing for a really long time. And I've seen people come and play church on Sunday, and they're completely different people for the other six and a half days of the week. So we ask ourselves, what's our motivation? Why are we here? If you can go to a church every single week and listen to the pastor preach and ignore everything and just go on with your life like you were never here, why did you come? You need to reflect. Our heart is precious and it needs to be sold out for him. If that's not your desire, what is? We really need to check that. I love this C.S. Lewis quote. Said, may God's grace give you the necessary humility. Try not to think, much less speak of their sins. One's own are a much more profitable theme. And if on consideration one can find no faults on one's own side, then cry for mercy for this must be be a most dangerous delusion. If you can't reflect on yourself and see an issue, (laughs) there's something wrong with your thinker. But we are so quick with an accusatory finger, and yet we're slow to reflect on what we're doing. Christ calls us to do the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Him. Why would we do that with a heart bent on disobeying Him? What would be the point? If if our hearts need to be clear and focused, do that. If it's not, step back from the table and make sure that we're not bringing judgment on ourselves. You know what? Here's the reality, guys you can always step back up to the table.
and, and I'm not like some churches where you're not worthy, you're not worthy, you can't do this because you did this, and it's, you know what, you're grown, you're grown people. It's not my decision to, to decide whether or not you commune with God or not. That's completely up to you. That's why the scripture says you drink it onto yourself. My plea is basically the same as Paul's. Come here with a heart towards God and not greed or anything else. Focus, on, focus our time on remembering what Christ did for us. And spreading that love to other people. We, we can't come divided because we're one body. We do this in remembrance of his love, grace, and mercy poured out on us. If we're here for another purpose, then we completely miss the point entirely. We need to take the time to properly reflect on ourselves, to see the things that we may need to correct. There's nothing wrong with that. Because I can tell you right now, every single one of us has things that we need to correct. There's only one perfect, there's only one perfect person. We killed him. So we, we need to remember this. Our Lord wants us to commune with Him. He wants that relationship. With that said, let me have some volunteers come up here and hand out communion. We're going to just go right into that. And I do, while they're handing this stuff out, I, I want us to just bow our heads and take a minute to reflect on what's going on in your life. And I, I want to say, guys, hold on for just a minute. Um, stay right there. Stay right there. Stay right there. Stay right there. Don't go nowhere. Just stay right there. Um, I, I want to take a minute. I want to bow our heads now because I want you two to do it too. I, I want to take a minute and just bow our heads and reflect on anything. And seriously, if there's something that, that you need to work through, you can always talk to me. You can talk to Raul. You can talk to Ben. You can talk to any of the guys. Any of the, if you have a female, whatever. It doesn't matter. Talk to somebody. Don't, don't let it go. Because just sitting there and dealing with the same junk and just kind of stuffing it back to the side and not actually dealing with the issues, it, it's not hurting your relationship with anybody else but yourself and God. So let's just take a minute, bow our heads, and then I will have those guys pass those out. As we, as we pass out the communion elements, I want you guys. Go ahead, go ahead. I want you guys to just think about: Are we are we coming to the table correctly? This isn't this isn't like a condemnation message. Because Christ is always there. Think about, think about the people in the Bible who are heralded as the, the, the great heroes of the faith. You have David who was a murderer and an adulterer. God was faithful to forgive him. Whatever's going on in your life, it's not too big or too bad that God won't forgive you. We just have to humbly come before him. And I think so many times our pride won't let us because we just, no, I can handle it on my own. I can deal with it my own way. And you don't have to. Hey, good job. Thank you, sir. 
so those are almost passed out. I got one more. And then we will we will pray really quick and all right, let's let's pray. Lord, we just thank you again for your for your providence for the sacrifice of your son on the cross, for that once and for all atonement. We pray that you would help us to come to you in a way that is worthy, in a way that we have just total love and relationship with you. We don't want any hindrances. We don't want anything that, that's, that's between you and us. We, we want to repent of any sins that we have, Lord, and we ask that you would just forgive us of those. Um, help us to just draw closer to you through everything that we do and help us to understand that, that you, you do show us un, unconditional grace and mercy all the time. It, it's, it's a gift that, that we can't earn and we can't... We can't Sacri- we can't sacrifice anything for. We, we try so hard in our works to do things, but it, it takes away from the work that you did, and we don't want to do that. We just want to come to you with a clear heart and just say, God, we just love you. So as we, as we take this bread, Lord, we just want to do that in remembrance of what you did for us on the cross, your body that was broken and the suffering and the pain that you went through that was just out of pure love for us, and we thank you for that. And as we take this juice, we just want to thank you again for your blood that was spilled. Lord, we do love you, and we praise you, and we just thank you for the work that you did on the cross. And as we continue our service today, Lord, We just pray that you would help us to always remember to do things in a way where we're showing love and and, and adoration for you. Whether it be conversations with our friends, whether it be coming to the Lord's Supper, but we do all things in a a way that reflects the the love of Christ and all all that we partake in. And so we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing a song before we go.
people said amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, smile on you and be gracious to you, show you his favor and give you his peace. Y'all have a blessed week. And remember, block party next week. Invite your friends. <laughs>